Hey friends, you're about to watch our weekly conversation with our team, our backstage talks, dive with Daniel Weiman. And in this episode, we talk with Alan, our software development, Thais from our marketing team, Andre from our marketing team, and we discuss a lot of things from the startup world. How how does it feel to be joining the startup world when you come from other worlds? How it is to be a developer in the startup world? And a bunch of stories of my, from my life that I share with the guys. <laughs> I, I, I really think you'll like it. All right. Let me start then. Um, Andre, you're a musician and an artist and a video maker that just um, just started working with startups. And of course, we all live in a society that where startups are part of our culture, but you just started working with startups. How How's the experience so far? How, how weird it is, how normal it is, and what are the insights? To me, I, I didn't say weird because I think that weird is a, it's a strong word, but I think that what, what the, the thing, the thing that most got my attention is how, how people try to do things differently than the usual, you know? Uh, and that uh, we can apply that in, in every area, uh, from marketing, from the rela relationship between people, clients. Uh, I, I sense that people are trying to make differently from the usual. They're trying to make a new, new relationships, uh, new ideas, new ways of working together and collaborate. Uh, to me, that is the, the thing that that speaks out, you know, when when we talk about this. What's, what do you feel like something that's not good about it? If if you already know, know because what, what you mentioned, I think is good being different. I think it's a, it's a little bit too soon, maybe, to to know what is wrong with this, <laughs> what is wrong <laughs> with you people. But <laughs> but maybe maybe that's the, the what is bad about it's the same thing, you know, because th there is risk in this. Yep. And with risk comes well, th things can go wrong and not work out this way and the old way and the conventional way m maybe sometimes will work better than th this new way that we don't know about so yeah. maybe it's the same thing the good and the bad thing it's that you're trying to make something different something new and it's very common that that uh People want to do something different just for the sake of doing something different or, or worse for the hype of it, for making. Um, sometimes it's, it's for the money that, that you could um, get if, if this thing that's different that you're creating is like, I don't know, a huge success, but it's um, almost impossible for something that's different only for the sake of being different to be a success. So, but it's not only about the money right now. It's there's so much prestige in being an entrepreneur and being a founder of a startup and I'm doing my, my own thing and I'm going to be huge and et cetera, et cetera, that you end up sometimes creating things you could as very well create something that's not that different, but makes makes a difference. And you end up creating something that's, I don't know, wildly creative, but useless if 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 you're not doing it for the right reasons, right? Yeah, uh, now that you mention it, uh, uh, I'm saying this completely, uh, but 
I feel this. Okay, I, I don't know the I don't know the market so well, but I have this feeling. Maybe maybe it's a little biased. My opinion is a little biased, but I think that maybe the, the maybe the, the the startup market uh, are are starting to attract people that don't want to make things different and only people that I want to make money. Yep. This is the way to make money. This is the yep. new way to make money. And I, I don't know if that's true, but I have this feeling that that's we're leaving <laughs> this, this right now. And well, it's kind of a bummer because I think that there are great people that are really trying to make difference and create something to help people like some projects that I hear you talk about and it, it blows my mind. I'm not a business person and I th and it it, um, it makes me believe in something. Wow, this can make a huge difference in people's yeah. lives, you know. But at the same time, I think that like every market that starts to grow, sooner the, the, the growth uh, starts, the sharks <laughs> yeah. appears, you know, and yeah, let's make some money. The hype. That, yeah, the hype. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, there's so much excitement about it that um, both entrepreneurs or not non-entrepreneurs, both um, people that want to start, start a business are, are attracted to it and people that have some money uh laying around in in i don't know in a low yield investment that they want to make more money from and they say oh okay let's do it. Uh, let's put it into startups and then yeah it, it starts to grow and and i don't know if we we're living a bubble or something like that today but it definitely has some of the elements of past bubbles and i've been uh <laughs> I, I was around uh before the 2000 um crash uh and i was working uh around 2000 i was working at a startup here in in brazil so we didn't have um we didn't have a bubble here uh we didn't have as big as a as big a bubble as as in the US, but we had a little bit of extra money uh, circling around, and I saw the effect of that. I was working at a company that hadn't launched its product in for over two years, and there was. Um, literally um an investment group uh, venture capital firm here in brazil that was talking about acquiring that company and we hadn't done much right <laughs> we hadn't almost nothing uh, 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 to be clear and and we were in brazil so yeah, imagine it's, the it's hype fishy. you yeah <laughs> yeah imagine the hype for something that's exploding in the united states to come to brazil and still have some some hype and people want to invest or buy a company that didn't do a anything of value yet which we will we will probably end up doing something of value in the long term i'm not saying we're we're doing the wrong things or something that that wasn't uh, promising but it was too early so uh and then the the there was the <clears throat> the crash in the United States, and of course, it it affected here. And then, what happened is that only the people that really wanted to create startups stood uh, and continued uh, in the game. And then we had this this no this new. Um, this collection of great startups we see today that, that launched in the mid 2000s, like YouTube or Google was around before that, uh, Amazon was around before that, but uh, I don't know. Um, 
bunch of them. Twitter, uh, the, all the, the social media stuff was created by people that they weren't um, following a trend. They really, really wanted to do it. And right now we have a trend. People, people want to be the next um, Uber. And uh, how do you think that the market uh, deals with, with those kind of people? You think that the market itself uh, separate that? And okay, no, you don't have a great idea. You are just going with the flow and you will not work out or no, you, you had space for everything. <laughs> I think the answer to that is whether we're not in a bubble. Because when you're in a bubble, the, the market stops making this value judgment and just uh, get, gets greedy, greedy. And and I don't know if, even if it's not greed, it's like irrational. And in too excited for its own sake. So if we're not, if we're not in a bubble, but we, of course, there, there is, there's a spectrum in between, right? If we're not in a bubble, I think people will be more rational or more grounded because it's not even rational. It's making, being able to follow their intuition also and filter out. The market will filter out people that, that do not have perseverance. And if you don't have perseverance today, you, you won't be able to succeed uh, creating a startup. And maybe that answers the question of whether we're not in a bubble, maybe not, because I don't know, I don't know of any successful startup that didn't require a lot of perseverance. And in the past, uh, in the pre-2000 uh, era, the, I, I, I know a bunch of companies that, that were sold and, and exited without much perseverance. It was so fast that you didn't even uh, had the time to persevere. And uh, how, how those people get in this market? Because uh, uh, if you have a traditional business, you, you used to listen everything about startups and great ideas and a lot of those kind of things. But how do you get in the market? You mean, how do you start a startup or how yeah. do you decide to start a startup? How do you know how to start Perfect. a startup? I don't know. I, I, I can tell how... how I did it when I wanted to <laughs> to do it. I just I just um, learned how to to create a product and launched it and started bugging people to use it, right? And then um, a few products nobody wanted to use, and then some some people wanted to use, and I was experimenting with. Uh, many many projects. Uh, for example, we, at, at the time I had a um, we're talking about the early early two thousand uh, actually mid two thousand from two thousand five two thousand six until the end of the decade. We we had a a development software development shop that wanted to become the next base camp. In, not, not in the sense of uh, creating a project management software, but by following what 37 Signals, the company that created Basecamp was doing. And we just started creating products. I, I, I don't know if I will remember them all to, to share with you, but we created, for example, one that was called Multimedia Library, where um, um, ad agencies would... Um, store all, all their assets like their Photoshop files, their PDFs, etc, cetera, etc cetera, and we'll be able to preview them without having to download huge files uh, what, what today is very common with Dropbox, etc, etc cetera, et cetera, wasn't as common then and then we started selling to, to agencies and we hated working with agencies so we just dropped it dropped it it was it sucked i had to to travel to sao paulo 
and uh, had like this big fancy meetings and <laughs> and in the end um i think part of it it was my inexperience but in the end nobody wanted to pay for for what we had probably if i was um better than at at selling i would uh, uh, have uh, found more interest or or i would have talked to more agencies because it's a numbers game right i don't know how many agencies i visited but it was wasn't a lot until we decided no no we don't want to we love the technology we created it it works but we don't want to work with these people and then we i don't know we, we went through probably four or five products before we found one that got traction and it was an email marketing um, company that in the end we ended up selling to to an internet provider here and it was like Brazilian MailChimp. We we loved MailChimp. And, and I don't know, it was early in MailChimp's history. And they weren't, they didn't intend to come to Brazil. We we actually, I think we actually contacted them to see if if they were going to come to Brazil or, or make a Portuguese version. They they weren't planning to do so. And we said, okay, let's do ours. Um and after a few um, product ideas that we tested, we we found one that that got traction, and that's how we entered the startup market. But we were already in the software development business. If if you're not in the software development business um, and want to start a startup, maybe you will. I don't know. You have to learn a few things, um, a few more things, because w I'm talking uh, about us, like literally a few years before we actually found a product that worked. And imagine if you're not uh, experienced in the software business industry or, or et cetera, it probably um, takes more time. Well, um, since you're talking about uh, things that that go wrong go wrong uh, yeah, yeah. in the, in the early wrong. days <laughs> <laughs> i want to ask you about something that um in in the next meet in the the earlier the the previous meeting that we talked uh you talk about the relationship with clients and how you try to to make things equal and not try to to, to be it. condescending to them and etc yeah. and now i ask you how what happens when when how do you deal with conflict with your client <laughs> it's a good since uh, <laughs> since you, you try to make these things equal but i don't know let me think about something that you know that your client is wrong and he doesn't seems to he's too stubborn to to listen to you or anything like that how do you deal with that i always know that it, it is their business so uh i wouldn't say the conflict uh we have much conflict with this kind of situation because i i literally always know that it's it is their business and um i've been proven wrong so many times in my assumptions about when something is wrong or not, that I don't trust my um, analysis that much anymore, which which is uh, progress, I would say. <laughs> and given that I don't, um, give, given that I had these experiences of, and maybe I can tell a story or two about it, and of not believing in someone or someone on someone's approach or someone's idea or someone's startup and then three four five years later they they are still around and they're now successful i i start by thinking that i might not be right and they might not be wrong 
but um, we have a lot of conflict nevertheless they just don't don't usually arrive from from this part of the the story the the most um, recent experience is like season is growing we we hired a bunch of people in the past month or so and we're in a growth spurt and when we gr we grow we make more mistakes and we become less productive inevitably the, no no matter what we do to prevent that and conflicts arrive when our perception of our progress is not the same of the project's progress is not the same as the client's and in past times in past growth spurts of the company i dealt with that by let's say i was in the trenches too much too zoomed in in the processes that i couldn't see um as clearly that i shouldn't uh trust too much our evaluation of our pro progress that i should um look at I, i should zoom out and see things with more perspective at this moment i'm trying to stay 100% zoomed out at all times which which is what a ceo of a growing company should do in or at least alternate and zooming in and then very quickly zooming out again, zooming in very quickly, zooming out again. And I think we're actually being able to achieve that. Uh, I've been uh, for the past couple of weeks, uh, my, the thing that I've been saying is that I've been apologizing in meetings at least once a day, <laughs> which is, I'm sorry. We, We couldn't um, achieve the goals we were setting out to do. And we here is how we are addressing it. We are changing this and that very specific, very transparently. And hopefully that, hopefully we won't make so many mistakes that our clients will leave us. <laughs> That's the, the, the thing. And hopefully we will learn so much from the mistakes we make that, that it will end up paying off the investment that we're making and the investment of patience and sometimes uh, opportunity costs that the clients are having to, to invest while we're growing. But it's still a conflict. We still have to, to talk about it. And, and last week was, it was great. We, we had a, a, a weekly call, we called it the sprint call with a client that the team had um, achieved 100% of the goal they set for the week. Like was a seemingly a success. I looked at the list and I knew from, from my experience that the problem was that the goal was set too low. It's not that we had a great week. We just said uh, we lowered the bar because, of course, we 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 are trying to be conservative and not create false expectations, and th this is a good instinct. But when I looked at the result, I saw a bunch of things marked as done, but they were too small. So it, 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 we could definitely, I don't know, in in our best weeks, do I don't double the work in a week. And the, um, the product owner of the project, uh, he, he got into the meeting. He was going to get into the meeting with the feeling of this was a great success, a great week. And I knew the client would not agree to that. And like three minutes prior to the call, I, I called him and said, oh, I'm going to open the, the meeting by saying we had a bad week. And he was, what? <laughs> And in the end, it was worth it because uh, the client felt the same way as, as I did. And I could only see it the way um, I did because I was zoomed out. 
I wasn't attached to, to the work itself. So it's it's a teamwork. It's good that the team consider it a victory because it was a victory. Given our circumstances, it was a victory. We set out a goal and we achieved it. We just don't need to... We just need to address the, the actual output also. We, we, we had taken care of the process. We hadn't achieved the, a good out, outcome. But we will because, because we're doing those things, right? Yeah, you, you have the victory, but you couldn't brag about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like you're, you're playing minor league baseball, but, but your sponsor is thinking you're, you're in major league. Well, <laughs> why, why should you brag about winning a minor, minor league game? <laughs> uh, okay fazer uma pergunta, Dani, sobre essa questão dos conflitos, como comunicar isso para o cliente, tipo, ter essa visão do futuro. Uh, eu sei que é o Product Owner é, que, hipoteticamente, tem essa função, mas, uh, na minha posição como dev, como é, comunicar isso, como passar isso para frente? I don't think neither the Product Owner or the developer should worry about it. And because it's not an issue to bring, uh, it's not the, the biggest issue to bring bad news to the client. It's, uh, it's very common. We're like playing um, a very difficult game. We, we're literally trying to do, uh, to be like athletes on, on, software development. So we will have bad weeks. We will have great weeks and we will have great weeks with bad outcome, with uh, low throughput, right? We will have all of those. The most important thing is to act actually to give the bad news to clients. The most important thing is not to avoid generating the bad news. It's to communicating transparently and learning from your work. We're not in the business of perfection. We're not in the business of um, getting it right. Startups are not about getting it right. It's about taking risks and um, mitigating the, those risks as best as we can. So if we have a bad week, Let's just deal with it transparently. And in, in our case, we, we, when it is a bad week that we consider we really failed, like um, it wasn't the work that got more complex or that the work that was much more complex than we anticipated was us, we, we played badly. We always try to compensate our clients and I don't know, put more resources uh, later on to, to compensate it or some, uh, sometimes extend the contract even if we, if we think um, we, we really damaged the... We, we didn't deliver what we sold. If we think we didn't deliver what we sold, we will compensate the, the client. But not all bad weeks are bad because we didn't deliver what we sold because what we sell is actually the team the high um, quality and high performance team and for startups this team takes risk and when you take risks you fail often i think i think i i didn't fully answer it i didn't say what the developer should do And I think the developer should focus on the current sprint only. No matter what the outcome will be, what the news you're going to bring to the client, if it is good or bad, doesn't matter. You're, you're the one um, in the court playing the game. Shouldn't think about what the post-game strategy is. And... Uh... I was thinking about the design in, in the whole process. Uh, 
uh, we didn't see much them particip participating in all dev shops, uh, at, at least in, not in the whole process. And it seems to me that at season, uh, we saw this uh, like the first thing that you guys, uh, I don't know, put in, a, in the package. The, the zoom yeah. out and the zoom in, it pass through the design. How do you see that and, and why it's so, it's so important? Maybe I should tell, um, tell you that we didn't start it like that. We started um, without designers in the team because the ideal way of really starting small with a startup is to have one person that does it all. Like one person that there's a bit of design, but uh, codes well. And, and I think I, I developed my skill sets like this. I, I, since, since I wanted to create my own startups, and I, and I did, and I didn't want to wait for a designer to give me that design that it, or pay or wait or, 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 or I couldn't pay a designer to, to do it. So I had to ask my friends and my friends would do it on their free time. And then I would have to wait. I didn't want to wait. So I learned how to do it myself. Of course, I'm not a good designer, but I'm a good enough designer. Like I, I did all the first versions uh, of the logos of my startups, my companies. And I don't know if all, but many of the many of them and um they were crappy <laughs> the design were, was terrible but it worked it worked and when when we started season i wanted to replicate that so we would be like the team that would do it um with as little as few people as possible as much as a startup needed. So we started without designers. But then two things, uh, I think three things happened. And the first one is not easy to train someone to do, to be a jack of all trades, a generalist like, like I, I did. I had a strong motivation to become a generalist because I really, really, really wanted to launch my startups as fast as possible and and I didn't care if the design wasn't optimal and I didn't care if the code wasn't optimal as well I, I just wanted to to get it out so we well, our developers didn't have the skill set to actually be skilled enough in design so they could create good user interfaces and user experiences. But they were great at the at development, L literally great at software development. They just needed someone else to do it for them, the, the design part. Another thing that happened is that when we didn't have a design in the in the team, usually our clients wanted to get the design and they hired someone else to do it. And having worked with world-class designers in the past, I knew what the clients were getting wasn't ideal. And it was very hard to integrate what the design firm created with what we wanted to create, right? So... Um, we we actually decided let's bring design to the to the core of the the company and i would say to the core but initially it wasn't as uh central as it is today we we brought larusso our head of design and he started working with us uh, almost two years ago now and he was doing the design and in He's a, a very seasoned designer, so he helped us create the process also as well as the design and implement it. Um, oh, sorry, I realized I just told about two of the things that happened. There is the third. 
The third one is that the culture changed. When I was doing my startups, this, um, people would use a, a badly designed app that, um, that worked and that solved their problem. Today, not so much. It's still, it, it is still possible. I think if I were to start a startup today, I probably would come up with a crappy design for, for an MVP before investing in the design. But it's not easy to, not as easy to convince people to use something that's badly designed today as it was uh, 10 years ago. I don't know, 11 years ago. It's a lot. I don't know how many, how many years. And then we brought up design to the team and it's only it i wouldn't even say that now it's central enough i think we need to make it more of of um put it at the center of the pro process process actually and we still need to figure out one thing in order for us to put it at the center we need to invest more in design but our market, even though it values design, it considers it necessary. Our clients, they are, the thing that they value the most is the development. So when we sell design right now, the, the way we sell it right now, people are not as willing to pay for design as they are for software development. So we need to, to either become better at selling design, which I wouldn't say either, probably both. We need to become better at selling design. And for that, I think we, we need to, to become better at design also. And we need to be so efficient in the software development part that it pays for the design sometimes. And the design will help the software development process become so efficient that it, it will pay for itself, even without us um, selling the design or increasing the price for that. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah, because uh, it, it's, uh, it's different from... Uh, I just get in the, this, this kind of business and, and inside this kind of, uh, of company. So uh, it, it's funny that for me, it, it seems like the, the design part um, accelerate the goals and the achievements of development yep. when, when it goes together, when yep. it's not two separate things. Like you said before, you, you hire a company for design and you have the, the developments here and then you have to put these two things together and uh, it, it's, it's a double work. And when you, you got the two things going Together, you, you optimize. Just to be clear, it's much more than double the work. When, when you have design and development as separate entities, it's much more than double the work because the designers will come up with something that's hard to implement. Isn't that, is it, is it right, Alan? <laughs> yeah, the designers will come up with something that's hard to implement and then the developers will say, oh, this is hard to implement. And then the, the person in the middle usually is the founder, the non-technical founder, right? And the, the non-technical founder in the middle will say, oh, but if this is hard to, to implement, let me go back to the designer and ask them to change it. And then they say, but you already paid me for this. You need to pay me more for me to change this. And it will take an extra week. And then every, every back and forth you have will cost you a lot. So um, even though we didn't start it like that, but, but it was naivete, I think it was because we thought we wouldn't need designers <laughs> and not that the clients would bring external designers. Uh, the best way to approach product design, like um, software design in the terms of uh, user experience and user interface, should uh, be part of the same team as the development developers. 
Yeah, but I guess it, uh, it has a lot of what you say before. Uh, the also the the people that didn't ask for a, lot, a bunch of design. Uh, uh, yeah, they 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 are starting to once we had a, a very well designed website, people started valuing us as designers because, of course, right, <laughs> and. The problem is, um, not the problem, the scenario is you're a non-technical founder looking to launch your product. You already uh, researched, researched how to create, you already probably created your logo using a designer or, or something else. You saw that it, it is easy to find designers, right? All right, it, it's easy to find designers. It's cheaper to hire designers than, than development. So you think, okay, I got this covered. I, I, I don't need to worry about design because I, know I, I could just go to, I don't know, 99 designs or other um, fancier design um, tech, uh, marketplace. And now I need the developers. Or in many cases, you already even have the what you think is the design for your app ready. Now you need the developers. And so our client is usually not looking for design or looking for designers. They are looking for software developers. And they, they come to us... Um, the um, this these are the least experienced clients because the the ones that have more experience will know they need the design to be integrated but they they will come to us and say okay you you do the design and and the um, and the coding also but i already have the design how can you give me a discount because because we we don't need the design this is not, um, this is becoming less and less common after word got out and, and word of mouth uh, start telling people that they, they should work with us. They will not be um, as concerned, but it's very common to, for someone that, that does not know the value of what we bring to the table to ask for the, how, how much, how much without the design, <laughs> like, and then we will say, no, no, without the design, it's actually more expensive. <laughs> we'll, we'll charge you more <laughs> without the design. You're not paying. And the, what I say today is that you're not paying for the design. The designers, we we added because we needed we need them. But we're if you if you even if you calculate the price only considering the development, you're gonna see we're charging you for development, development, and um, the designers, the architects the product owners, which are the, the rest of our, our team structure, are like a bonus you get. And that's, um, that's been working. I think when we become more efficient, we might even not need to start uh, raising the price because we want more design in the process. We might be able to continue with this approach, which is, you're paying for the development, the design is free. The management is free, which is crazy because we all know that management and design are not much more valuable than, than development, but at least as valuable as development. But it works. It works with, with, our, with, with, our, um, with our community. Yeah. Uh... I, I, I sense that people get uh, misleaded by the idea that, like you said, okay, I want to do this, this, I want to develop this, this product and I have the design solved. But in the end of the day, that turns out to, to transform this solution, transforms into a communication problem. Yep. And that's what you're trying to, to how do you say to 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 avoid you want yeah. to avoid that and so 
okay, no, I, I make the design for free because you know that we'll be more efficient that way. Yeah. And it's not for free. <laughs> it's it's uh, included in a price. It's not actually for free. It's just as as the way we w just a way of communicating. It's a bonus you get, but it, it is included in a pricing. And we 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 actually adjusted our pricing the first time we added designers. The only thing is that for early stage startups you you actually don't need for example a full time designer involved in your product pro product uh, at the the first i don't know one year or so of your startup so we are able to leverage that and have the designers as a shared resource between clients instead of a full time allocated resource as we have right now with developers and product owners all right i love the conversation today thank you so much see you next week thank you bye bye, bye.